Sana, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate you taking the time and bringing this topic to us and just all your advocacy um, with, with this topic. And I know you're gonna continue that work, which is so impressive given that you are entering your second year at the University of California, Riverside, and you are a fellow public policy major, you are one of so many students going through this, this struggle right now. In fact, 70% of UC Riverside students live off campus. Um, you know, this is an issue that crosses states. It's, it's a national issue. But for one school, you know, that's a pretty large number of students who are probably affected by this issue and going through something similar to what, to what you have been experiencing. So given that you are a student experiencing this issue, can you let us in on your experience these past few months, what it's been like, um, any struggles you've encountered and kind of what your plan is moving forward? Yeah, so most students sign their leases pretty early on, um, you know, as early as January and February to make sure they had their leases set, they had housing secured for the upcoming academic year. You know, most of us thought this was just the responsible, the reasonable thing to do at the time. But once COVID hit, we realized, oh, hey, you know, in-person classes are now suspended. Fast forward another month or two and we realized by the time the next academic year starts, we may be still online. Mm -hmm. At that point, there's no longer a need for most of these students to remain off campus, close to campus really. Mm -hmm. Personally, I'm up in the Bay, there's no reason for me to be renting an apartment 400 miles away. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, when I did make the calls to cancel my lease, I was told that that's not possible unless I A, pay a termination fee and B, find a replacement tenant. Unfortunately, because classes are online for nearly everyone at UCR, it is very difficult to find a replacement tenant who happens to be a student. Unfortunately, because these are student-centered off-campus apartments, they do require the tenants to be students. Right, it's, and you know, you're a student trying to leave. Most students are probably like you, who's gonna fill your spot to right. your point. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I started trying to figure out, okay, how many other people are in the same boat? And I learned, you know, it's over 200 students that I've been in contact with alone. Wow. Wow. So, you know, the numbers, that, that's the minimum. That, that's a really conservative estimate that we're looking at. At that point, I made a plan. Hey, you know, let me talk to city officials. Let me talk to county officials as well as UCR officials. Mm -hmm. So we got some really positive responses from a few city council members who were then able to sort of look into the situation, help out the students who were, uh, who were, you know, more troubled by the situation than others, you know, the students who were in a more urgent situation, and we were able to sort of look into negotiations from that point. But for, you know, the hundred other students who were unable to get out of their leases, it's a much more complicated situation. We had ongoing negotiations between a few city council members and these apartment management, mm -hmm. uh, these apartment managers. So these negotiations were not really fruitful in my opinion. We had over two weeks of negotiations and the only thing we got to was students can negotiate but they must come to us on a case by case basis. Oh, now nope. here's the okay. problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I as a student, am not equipped to negotiate with these large companies. You know, they have a large legal team. I'm a student, I have no legal education, I have no legal background, and I don't have access to a legal team. Mm -hmm. I'm already at a disadvantage here. So even if I do manage to find a lawyer, I'm paying out of pocket to negotiate for a lease, you know, that I really don't need. Mm -hmm. You can't afford either. Right. It's absolutely ridiculous. I'm in a situation where I'm lucky enough that this only hurts, but it's, it's devastating for some families, especially the students who were employed on campus. They no longer have access to those wages. Mm -hmm. So it's a really devastating situation. We recently began talking with UCR, a couple of the vice chancellors, and we're working on putting together some resources for students to actually be able to negotiate on their own. We're talking with legal counsel over at UCR and then a couple of um, outside options as well. Mm -hmm. Well, you've done such impressive work so far. 
you've managed to talk to these city officials and these chancellors, like not many students have the hope of even doing that. They just either suck it up or it's like pay those legal attorney fees. Right. So the fact that you're fighting for all these students is fantastic. And you, mm -hmm. Go ahead. yeah, I mean, I'm grateful for the opportunity. I'm grateful for the resources around me. The fact that I was able to put this together in such a short amount of time, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And you even have your own student spotlight coming up where you go into more detail of what you did. Right. And, and yeah, in the spotlight, I'm so grateful for the opportunity. This spotlight, I'll be able to talk about sort of the background of rent as a whole, landlord tenant relations, what this has to do with college students, mm -hmm. and how the framing of this problem has changed since COVID 19 has hit. I, and I can't wait to talk to you um, during that spotlight. I'll be emceeing and I'll be asking you questions, and there's going to be student Q&As or from the audience participation that I can't wait to see what we what we come up with and what um, what more light you could shed on the situation. Yeah, I'm super excited to just talk to people. It's a really important issue. And I think every student deserves to, you know, sort of learn from this. Mm -hmm. And if any of our listeners are interested, the student spotlight will be held on Thursday, September 17th from 1.30 to 2.30. And we'll be sending out We'll be posting Zoom links for anybody who's interested on joining this student spotlight with Sana. Yes, Sana, whether it's through the podcast or our student spotlight series, we're always looking to highlight our students. You're, you're one wonderful example of, of how our students are doing the work, you know, they're, they're taking what they're learning under our major and implementing it and, and putting it into action themselves. And for young adults such as yourself, what you know even though maybe the outcome you you desire isn't isn't there yet you know you're still working on it but just um it's amazing the progress you have made and that you located a problem and you're working to find a solution it's mm -hmm. so impressive it's inspiring and the fact that you're doing it selflessly not only is it for you but to your point um this is devastating to a lot of ucr students and mm -hmm. it's putting them in a corner uh, where they don't have options. You know, to your point, so many have lost their jobs. If you physically don't have the money to pay this rent, that's a very tough situation. And you're you're shedding a light on that and you're using your voice and it's so impressive. And I'm I I agree. I'm excited to attend that student spotlight seminar and and continue this conversation on on the history of renters' rights, what's going on due to COVID and and maybe discuss, you know, solutions to this to this really, really big problem. So Sana, I just want to thank you so much for joining us and for for speaking about, uh, you know, speaking on your experience. Um, it's a very important and topical issue. Um, and I hope anyone listening, especially um, students, can can take something away, even you know, with you to know they just aren't alone and and that um, hopefully we can all come together and, and find a solution for, for everyone, regardless mm -hmm. of the situation you're in or, or where you are right now. So thank you so much for joining us, Sana. I really thank appreciate it. Thank, thank you so thank much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, Mr. Talkov, thank you so much for joining us today. We, we really appreciate it. And this topic of students, um, frustrated with with their housing um, options and and everything amid COVID is a big topic right now, especially as semester schools just started and and those of us in the quarter system are, are beginning uh, to go back to school. So you are the founder of Talkov Law and you practice real estate business and civil and bankruptcy litigation. Many students, not only in Riverside, but across the nation, live off campus and often rent and lease apartments and houses for the academic school year. Due to COVID-19, many, as I just mentioned, want out of their contracts. Can you explain legally what tenants agree to when they sign a contract? And does, it, does being a student affect the terms of any contract? Sure. Um, well, by entering into a contract, you agree to be bound by the laws of contract. Um, now, you may think that I signed something, but that means I owe it. 
Well, there's also defenses to contracts. So a couple that have really come to mind um, recently, um, I think, when people talk about force majeure, it's an interesting concept, but there's something called frustration of purpose. So the classic example is you rent a place to watch a parade and the parade is canceled. Well, you don't need it anymore and you may not even have to pay for that uh, lease or, um, or that rent for the day. Um, the same thing is going on by UC Riverside and a lot of other college campuses. Uh, and it really depends, you know, whether your landlord held themselves out, in my opinion, as in any way related to that college. So if you look at a lot of the places right near UC Riverside, you'll see on their advertisements on their websites, we are only open to UCR students. Not only have they said, this is really convenient, but they've said, you must fit this criteria. Well, and they even say, well, we're right next to the campus. You're gonna love what a short distance to campus it is. Well, it's not a short distance to camp. There is no campus anymore. My house, back in my parents' house, was the same distance. Right. I don't need to be here. So, um, uh, you're, you're, you're accepting all of the possible defenses um, by signing that contract. Um, now, I've done a little bit of research and I've happened upon a little bit of a theory in these cases that is real beneficial to students. I don't think these companies ever file lawsuits. I've done lots of homework. I have in my blog post at talcovlaw.com, if you click on the blog and look up the article, um, titled uh, 12 Tricks to Terminate a Student Lease at UCR Due to Coronavirus Force Majeure, you will see my research that, um, you know, there are probably 100 cases that I found on the Riverside County Superior Court website. Um, many of them are very recent, and every single one of them, I did a little sample of 10. I only have so much time in the day, but I found every single one of the 10 cases was an unlawful detainer. An unlawful detainer is when you are in possession and the landlord wants possession back. Uh, if you never take the keys, you never take possession, you're not going to fit in that category. You're going to fit in the standard, just breached a lease and they want their money because they couldn't find another tenant. Um, they've never sued for this. At least nothing I've ever found. Maybe they have, uh, but it's so rare. Now, if they didn't sue during normal times, what are they going to do when you have all of these defenses? Right. Probably nothing. Okay, now there's another issue. Um, the most common defense to a breach of a lease is mitigation of damages. So you will say, hey, you know, you uh, could have found a, a, a tenant. You should have used reasonable measures to find a replacement tenant. Well, if you look very closely at the leases, at least the ones I've seen, they don't say, you know, Joe student, you are being given unit uh, 101. They just say, we'll find you a unit. So if they don't give you unit 101 and you didn't agree to take unit 101, how did they ever prove that they didn't find someone for unit 101? You can just say, well, the next person that walked in that signed a new lease, they signed my unit. I, I, I think this would never come to pass. There's really only two other ramifications I can think of. Well, let's, let's say three. One, uh, one is the one we talk about, legal. They're going to get a judgment. They're going to record their judgment. They're going to levy on my bank account, blah, blah, blah. Okay. I don't think it's really going to happen. Uh, maybe it'll happen. Who knows? Probably not. Um, second is a uh, sending you to collections. What does that even mean? It just means that they're having somebody call over and over and over. Huh. Okay. Go ahead. Have them call. The third one is a ding on your credit, a negative report on your credit. Mm -hmm. I haven't been able to find anybody who's reported to me any negative credit report. Really? Um, no one. I don't know who these people are. I've, I've been on numerous conference calls. It's hard as some group at UC Riverside that's trying to solve this with the campus council and a number of other people, the um, campus ombuds, who's also a California attorney. And no one knows of anyone who's ever, this has ever happened to. So you go down the list, these are the three things. None of these are ever gonna happen. Now you're down to the fourth thing, moral obligation. Well. I think the reason students are listening to this is, is they don't think they owe the money. So, you know, just because somebody says you owe money doesn't mean you owe it. Oh my gosh. I, that's so interesting. And see, I didn't even know the, <laughs> there were those options or, or I love your research. And again, I, I don't even know where a student such as myself, where I have so many friends going through this problem right now, would even begin to look, you know, or, or consider these options. 
as options for them. And money is important, especially during this pandemic right now. And, and if students are able to take this opportunity, listen to this and go, oh my gosh, this applies to me. Oh my gosh, that's, that's amazing. Absolutely. And I hear a lot of students say, you know, they, they want to win this negotiation. They want to, they want to get what they want out of it. And I would tell them what they want is what they already have. Okay. The landlord wants your money. Okay. You already have your money. Mm -hmm. Okay. So every time you issue an online payment or do whatever you need to do and you pay them, the landlord has won. So you don't need to do anything. Tell them, send them a letter saying, I will not be moving in. I will not be paying. And it's now the landlord's job to get the money out of you. They, they claim they're owed and you claim is not owed. So um, the students are in a great position. They're the ones with the money and the landlord is with the one with the apartment that <laughs> isn't, uh, I don't want to say nobody wants, but very few people want. Um, so they're actually pretty lucky, but they just need to learn that just because somebody asks you for something doesn't mean you have to say yes. And it doesn't mean, and if you, if there's some reason, if there's some justifiable reason to say no, you're allowed to say no. Mm -hmm. And there's also a lot of um, student legal clinics. UC Riverside has one uh, through the Associated Students, uh, where I used to be a student senator. I enjoyed it quite, quite a bit. <laughs> oh, wow. um, oh my goodness. And, uh, you know, it, a lot of the campuses, um, um, from the UCs, the Cal States to colleges nationwide have a student legal clinic. There are attorneys to answer questions. Um, so Google your university and see if they have one and see if there's an attorney there to give you some quick advice to point you in the right direction. Well, thank you so much for that information. But can you explain more like on the steps that students could do at UC Riverside to terminate their contracts or their leases? Uh, I have a little draft uh, email that I um, made up um, on my blog post at talkoflaw.com. Uh, and it says, um, dear landlord, please accept this notice of termination um, that you allege I'm bound to perform despite the coronavirus pandemic occurring after the date of our lease. And it goes into some of the defenses I've talked about. And it says that you haven't shown me that this place is going to be safe. This mm -hmm. seems to be contrary to the uh, idea of social distancing, to be living in compact student housing. Mm -hmm. um, what is the proof that I'm not going to be suffering a personal injury by moving into your um, apartment complex? Um, and you also have a duty to mitigate your damages. Again, I reiterate that it's unclear how you'd ever prove that you attempted to mitigate your damages if you, given that you never assigned to be a particular unit. So how do we know whether that unit was ever leased or not leased? Um, and then I also point out that students have one particular level of lever of power that, um, you know, important people have their powers and unimportant people, you know, power less people with less power have, have other things. You have the power to go on online reviews. You can tell them I have oh. found a nut, a nut, 12 different places with mm -hmm. reviews about you. I will leave my, leave my review on every single one of these. If you send, if I get any call from a collection company, if I receive any summons in a lawsuit, or uh, if I receive any further communication from you about this property, say something like that. Just say, yeah, there's no reason to write me back. Now, you don't have to be that aggressive if you don't want to, but, but let them know you've got power. You know, you, you are letting people who are future residents of these properties know this place is really aggressive. Mm -hmm. They don't seem to care about anything. I offered them two or three months rent. They didn't want it. They want mm -hmm. the whole kit and caboodle. Now you got to think about it from their perspective. Okay, let's suppose they've got a hundred um, students staying there, eighty of which are all angry. They don't want to be paying this kind of money. They don't want to live near campus. Hey, now, out of those eighty students, if they just stand strong and say, "You better pay me," they might collect from I don't know half, uh, half of them in full, maybe eighty percent of them in full. Okay, why would they want to take a few months of rent from everybody? They, they don't want that. Um, they're going to make more money by people who are scared and who don't realize that probably nothing's going to happen. Wow. So it is as simple as sending an email declaring these are my intentions. And, you know, due to the research that you've just spoken about, odds are they'll take it and they will 
and you'll be kind of in the clear, most likely good to go, maybe a little bit of negotiation or, or back and forth. But for the most part, it sounds like there is a simple solution that many of us just don't think, right? That power, you don't think I can do this. You don't think um, we hold that power uh, to get out of this sticky situation. Yeah. And, and, and just last year, um, there were some students who had prepaid for a year. Uh, these were um, students coming in from China and they prepaid some middleman and that middleman didn't turn over their rent to the landlord. Okay, now in that situation, somebody's already got your money. Oh. So that's, uh, that's a tough situation. They don't have your money. You have not prepaid for anything that you don't want anymore. So um, students can, should consider themselves very lucky. Um, I'm not I'm being told about anybody who prepaid for anything. Um, so, you know, it, it really, it could be a lot worse uh, than it is now. Uh, so again, I just really want to thank you for joining us. Well, thank you so much, Madeline. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Genevieve. Thank you so much. So Mr. Szynski, you are a program manager at the Fair Housing Council of Riverside County. The council's mission is to provide comprehensive services which affirmatively address and promote fair housing, anti-discrimination, rights, and, and further other housing opportunities for all people. Absolutely, yes. And that's a wonderful mission, um, proving you know, itself right now with this issue. And due to COVID-19, um, I've heard a lot about eviction moratoriums um, that have been enacted uh, specifically in California. But for students who necessarily, you know, some of them do want out of their rents and leases, but some may have nowhere else to go, but perhaps they did lose a job or wages. Um, so is there a rent relief option available to students? Um, what are their options? Okay, in terms of if they um, are staying in the unit but they lost their income, then the uh, rental uh, eviction moratoriums, uh, the most recent one, which was signed uh, into law on Monday uh, at the state level, would absolutely protect them. Um, they simply need to advise the landlord that they are unable to pay their rent due to the COVID-19, because it must be related to COVID-19, Mm -hmm. um, and the only downfall to that is that students need to realize that once the pandemic is over, once it's lifted, they will still be responsible for uh, paying that, that back rent. Interesting. So let's say six months pass and, mm -hmm. and, and they don't have to pay it in the moment. Um, do they have to pay that large sum all at once or will they add it on maybe every month? This is still yet to be completely determined. The way that it was explained and the way that the original rent moratoriums for all of the different counties were, uh, was set up is they would have six months to become current. They'd have to start paying their rent and they'd have six months to spread it out. The problem that we see at the Fair Housing Council of Riverside County with that is if you can't pay your rent now, the moratorium gets lifted, Maybe you go back to work, maybe you don't, because again, not all jobs that people had are available, but now you have to pay your rent. If you then put on top of that, having to catch up on, say for example, six months rent, when you start adding all that on there, it's gonna become very unaffordable. Originally, uh, the idea was it was only gonna be for three months, and then you'd have three months to catch up. And even for, for students, non-students, that was still gonna be a problem but it's not insurmountable. Um, now, the one thing in addition to that, let's say, um, because they, they do reside in the city of Riverside. So the count of the city of Riverside has a program for uh, rental rent relief. And what it's set up to do is, is to bring you current on your rent. And Fair Housing Council of Riverside County is actually managing that program. So as long as you reside in the county, uh, in the city, not county, in the city of Riverside, and you're, uh, you fell behind due to COVID-19, and you can prove that when uh, you're ready, when the students are ready, they can apply for the funds, and those funds are paid directly to the landlord. They're not paid to the student, they're paid to the landlord to bring them current. 
So mm -hmm. there is there is that for those students that are going to be remaining in those properties. Uh, so there there is help. Wow, and is that um, is there an idea of how many students will be able to help with that? What will it vary? Well, it's because it's for the whole city. So it's, it's a first come first serve. Okay. Um, and um, I don't have the exact dollar amount that's um, available currently. Um, but I know it was in the neighborhood of between two and a half and $3 million. And wow. that is for assistance in the city of Riverside. Um, but, you know, like I said, it, it's first come first serve. Uh, the packages are once a complete package is received um, and you can go onto our website to find out what's needed. But once a complete package is received, that puts you in line for it. Um, and that's when we when we consider first come first serve, it's first come with a complete package. Because mm -hmm. uh, as you know, some people don't get complete packages in on time. Mm -hmm. Right. OK. And they can find that at your website. So we will absolutely. We will definitely link that in our show notes um, for resources okay. for, for our listeners to go there and see if they apply and, and if they can complete that package. And again, like, like I said, the rent moratorium that was signed in on Monday may make it so that people will want to hold off a little bit longer because mm -hmm. you can only apply once. So that's, that's the other key there. So it's trying to find that balance of when do you apply and realizing that you can only do it one time. So that, that's something else to keep in mind. Um, before the moratorium was re-signed by the state legislation and the governor, all the moratoriums had been lifted. So we were expecting everything to start pouring in immediately. But with this new moratorium, it takes you actually all the way out to December right now. Wow. Well, that's great to hear that there's this resource for students who are living in Riverside County. But city of Riverside. The city of Just, Riverside. Yeah, it's not. It's oh. not the county. The county has their own program, but it's it's mm -hmm. operated through um, different organizations. Uh, one mm -hmm. is the uh, United United Lift, I believe it is through mm -hmm. the United Way, um, and that is for the it's countywide, but that's mm -hmm. even stretched out further. But because we're talking about residents in the city of Riverside, mm -hmm. that's why I mentioned this one. I see. I see. Well, do you? any state policies that are implemented to help students because we have a lot of students who are from the bay area from other parts of california and even out of the state do you know mm -hmm. anything that could help students policy wise um, in terms of they they don't want to move they don't want to move into the residences or they need to vacate unfortunately the answer to that one is no um, mm -hmm. there still is that requirement a lease has been signed um, and here at Fair Housing Council, we totally understand. We get calls almost every single day from parents, from students, trying to figure ways to get out of these leases. And, and we do understand it. When you're looking at the pandemic on a statewide basis or even on a national level basis, unfortunately, the student housing issue is not at the top of the list of legislation. Um, we have been working with local officials, with state officials, attempting to find a workaround that is good for both the students and the uh, property owners. Because mm -hmm. just to, to tell a property owner, well, you know, sorry, uh, we're going to cancel all these and you're out of luck, mm -hmm. that's not good business either. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. One of the things that um, I'm, I'm part of a, a group that deals with uh, student housing there at UCR. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've been talking about is certain ways that we can encourage the um, off-campus student housing apartments to work with the tenants that want to get out. Um, there, there is always the option to just walk away and say, okay, take your best shot. Um, I just don't think that's the best way to go my background before getting into fair housing was in mortgage lending. So I know the effects of credit. Um, small mistakes that you make today are definitely going to impact you for, for the future. Really no, there's, there's so. not a lot that's currently available. The most that can be done is to try and work with these landlords. See if you can't get them to let, let you out of the lease. Um, they don't seem to be very willing to do that um, from everything that I've heard. 
Um, their leases are full of a lot of language that if it went to court, it probably wouldn't stand up. So mm -hmm. there are requirements that are written in there because like a lawyer told me, you can put anything in a contract. Mm -hmm. um, but the bottom line is unless you take it to court, unless the student or their parents take that housing provider to court, it's still they have that obligation because they signed the lease. And it's so difficult because myself as a college student, I've heard of credit, but it's not a reality necessarily for me yet, or it's not something that I, is on my mind. Um, but I know it's on my parents' mind and, and just bringing up that, oh, if, if they co-sign, which is very, very common, you're hurting them as well. And I think students, it's a whole world and between the legal jargon and contracts and maybe not knowing the red flags of some of their actions or the consequences, you know, they just feel like they're kind of in a bind. So. Well, you brought up a, a really interesting point and, and it's something that, that I think is worth revisiting. Um, you said as a college student, credit's not really on your mind, but you're at that age and the students are at that age where credit should be on your mind because what you do today is absolutely going to affect your future up to and including uh, employment opportunities. I um, mean, this is something a lot of people don't uh, realize, particularly students that are still in school. They think, okay, all I have to do is go to school, get a degree, and I'm going to go get a great job. Well, one of the qualifications for a lot of jobs is they run your credit. Mm -hmm. So you might have the grades, you might even have the experience, you might have everything else along with a whole bunch of other people. And so the determining factor may be the credit because the way that they look at it, right or wrong, and, and there's a lot of arguments one way or the other, but the way they look at it is if you can't manage your credit, what type of worker are you gonna be? Will you be able to manage your time? Will you be able to manage your work? So even though it's not technically a direct reflection of your qualifications or abilities, it does go towards uh, showing a picture of who you are. Mm -hmm. And these mistakes that you make in younger years, believe it or not, are harder to work off than if you made the same mistakes in your 50s or 60s. Mm -hmm. For some reason, you can repair your credit a lot faster in your 50s and 60s than you can in your 20s and 30s. It's mm -hmm. just the way the algorithms are written. So um, everything that I do, it's not technically a fair housing issue. And yet to me, it's all fair housing because it's all about making sure that people have access to housing. And credit is an extremely big point in that access. Thank you so, so much for joining My us. My pleasure. I, uh, the, the last thing I want to, I just want to add is if any of your students do need assistance or they're running into problems, they can always give our office a call because while I said there's not a lot of options, we can still walk them through it. We can explain to them what they are. We can even review some leases because quite frankly, some of the leases have, they're not discriminatory in nature, but they can have a discriminatory effect. Mm -hmm. So that may be a way that we can help. Um, so if they do have issues, please feel free to give our office a call. Wonderful. And again, that will be in the show notes. Um, a link to your website and, and we'll include a phone number as well. I think this is a wonderful resource um, and I think our listeners should, should take you up on that offer. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank my, you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you.